Acts chapter 6, verse 1 through 6. And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So many of the widows who had been receiving help from the second or third tithe at that time that was given to the church, they weren't receiving proper care. See, we have a social security system today and we're supposed to help people who are on that system. Well, this was the way of God's social security system in those days. A first tithe was to support the Levitical priesthood and the ministry of Jesus Christ in Old Testament Israel. The second tithe was to take you to the feast each year. And then every third year there was even a third tithe, which you kept within your own gates, and the Levites in that city distributed um, to the widows and the orphans and the poor Levites themselves. And so this was God's financial system at that time. Well, this was carried over into the New Testament church, and so many of the new converts were not receiving help from the church. Verse 2, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look you out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we'll give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Then verse 5 and 6, And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they, notice, the congregation chose out people that they knew were full of the Holy Spirit. The ministry didn't do it. The congregation did. And that's why I believe at any time, if this congregation feels there is someone here who should be ordained in the ministry or in service in some way, let's do it. You bring it to my attention and let's do it. I believe that. It's a, and it's an example right here. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, Philip. And then it goes on and lists them. But in verse 6, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. A doctrine of Jesus Christ. They set aside these men for a special service in the work of God. And this is legitimate. And what did I say the meaning of the Greek word laying was? One of it was an imposition of hands officially. Putting on of hands officially. And we are officially separating men who are approved by the works of their life and the fruits of God's Holy Spirit in their life to a special service over and beyond to serve the congregation. Now Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. There is another reason why we need to understand, or the same reason we need to understand the doctrine of laying on of hands, special service. Chapter 13 of Acts, verses 1 to 3. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger and Lucius. So Barnabas and Simeon, they were prophets and teachers. And it lists a few others. Then down in verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord, so they were serving God, and they fasted. Look what it says. The Holy Spirit said. Okay, so there is some way that God's Holy Spirit put into their minds thoughts. And we're going to read what it said. Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. So God's Spirit does work supernaturally in the mind of a Christian and a believer. And he makes things known. And if we deny that spirit, we're denying Jesus Christ. Because it's God's spirit. It's his spirit. Verse 3. And when they, these teachers and prophets, had prayed and fasted and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Once again, the laying on of hands for the official setting apart for a service of God. And this was to be a supernatural service because God specifically said, I want these men, and they laid hands on them, and they went their way to serve in a supernatural capacity. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, 1 Timothy chapter 5, but notice in each case, the laying on of hands was a vital part of the ministry. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17 to 22. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, 
Well, this has been a controversial scripture for some time, so since I was going to speak on it today and quote this verse, I thought I'd better look it up and make sure I did my homework <laughs> to make sure that we didn't have a controversy. The word double in Greek means twofold more. And I can't deny this because I looked it up and saw it with my own eyes. And the word honor means money paid or, or it could be either one, or esteem. So if a minister in our midst does do well, and if we're paying him, if there's, say, two or three ministers and one of them is doing a fantastic job, you have the right to pay that person more, double, than you do the other. Or you can, if there is no pay, you can esteem a minister who's doing well above the others who are doing less. But it's according to the context. That's what determines whether it's money or whether it's just esteem. But it does say it, so I have to believe it. That the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle the ox that treads out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. So based upon this context, it's talking about reward for work. Therefore, it should be money. So if there are several er elders in an area and one of them is doing an outstanding job, the congregation does have the right to pay that person more. And, it's, and he should. Verse 19. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. And that's the way it is all the way through the Old Testament. Nobody's condemned unless there's two or three witnesses. And we notice that those two or three witnesses had to go first outside the camp and lay hands on that person before they stoned them to death, showing that they were the ones who were witnessing against them. They were the ones who were responsible. And God would hold them responsible for them being truthful. And so it is that God holds it the same way in the New Testament. We're not to receive accusation against ministers except there's two or three witnesses to prove that that person is wrong. Okay, now let's go on in context here. Them that sin rebuke before all. So brethren, if I sin and you have two or three witnesses to absolutely prove it and you come to me privately as a minister... And if I won't listen to you, you have the right to rebuke me before the whole congregation. That's going to keep me on my toes. <laughs> and if we understood that, it would solve a lot of problems in the churches all over the world. <laughs> Them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. And the word fear is correct. It means respect. We all better respect God and respect the word of God to make sure we don't sin. Now verse 21. I charge you before God. Now this is Paul charging Timothy, who was a young minister, and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angel. So boy, he's putting him before a mighty host here. God, Jesus Christ, and the angels. That you observe these things without preferring one before another. So no... Um, Prejudices, No prejudices at all. Doing nothing by partiality. Lay hands suddenly on no man. Neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep yourself pure. So not only are we to lay hands on people to set them aside for a special service to God, but we had better be careful before we lay hands on them because it says lay hands suddenly on no man. You better make sure we know that person inside and out. We've got to know whether he is of God and whether he's going to hold faithful to the word of God before we set him apart. Because the laying on of hands consecrates him to the service of God. And God is powerful. And the laying on of hands works miracles, which we'll see next. And so when God sets apart, he sets apart. So we had better be careful not to misuse the doctrine of laying on of hands. So we'd better be careful and make sure that that person is truly of God and his spirit is right before God. But there's a fourth reason. The first one was blessing children. The second one, so that you could receive the Holy Spirit. And the third reason was to set aside for a special service. There's a fourth reason for the laying on of hands. Let's start in Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. Verse 22 and verse 23. And behold, there comes one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, 
And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. All right, so he, he came to Jesus and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. I pray you come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she shall live. Well, this was the introduction of this man to Jesus. And he wanted to know. He, he came to him. He knew there was something to the laying on of hands. Then let's drop down in verse 35 to 43. Verse 35. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Your daughter is dead. Why do you trouble the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. And brethren, this is one thing that the church of God has to do, is believe with absolute belief. Without one doubt whatsoever, we have to so ask for God's Spirit that we will never doubt when we come to him in a prayer. He says, believe. Now, this girl is dead. And Jesus told him, just believe. Only believe. That's all I ask of you. Just believe. Verse 37. And he suffered no man to follow him. So he didn't allow any of them to go except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and seized the tumult. They were all crying and weeping and wailing, which, of course, we would do too. Then in verse 39. And when he was come in, he said unto them, Why are you making all this ado? And why are you weeping? The damsel is not dead, but sleeps. Of course, he understood because he was the God of the Old Testament. He made men. He made Adam. He made Eve. And he knew what death was. It was just a residing there, and there was coming a resurrection. So he could bring them back to life. But they didn't understand that. Verse 40. And they laughed him to scorn. They didn't believe. But the father believed. But when he had put them all out, he took the father and the mothers and, and the mother of the damsel, and then them that were with him and entered in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, and he used a couple of words that were not of the Hebrew language, which is being interpreted, Damsel, I say unto you, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of twelve. And they were astonished with a great astonishment. Jesus Christ got the attention of these people by healing this girl. And the man knew that it was through the laying on of hands that this could be accomplished. Verse 43, And he charged them straightly that no man should know it. So he told them not to spread this word of this healing. And I believe this is one mistake that is made. Some people do understand the doctrine of laying on of hands, and the laying on of hands does heal. It's the power of God to heal. But then they make a mockery of it. Jesus Christ said, Don't go tell anybody. Keep it a secret. I'll do it. Fine. I came. I've healed. You, you believed. I did it. I performed it. But he said, don't go tell anybody. He didn't make a mockery of the power of God. But he did, through the laying on of hands, heal and raise this girl from the dead. Mark 6, verse 5. Mark 6, verse 5. And he could there, okay, we've got to go back in the context. Jesus was in his own area of the country. And the people did not believe in him. As a direct result, look what happened. Verse 5, And he could there do no mighty works, because faith, see, they didn't have faith. Faith, that's where it is. It's all wrapped up together. The only thing he could do was he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. But once again, it's the laying on of hands combined with belief, faith in Jesus Christ. And that's one of the fundamental doctrines found in Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. Faith in God, and then the laying on of hands comes hand in hand. Mark 8. Mark 8. Verse 22. And he comes to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of town. And when he had spit in his, in his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him, if he saw anything. And he looked up, verse 24, and said, I see men as trees walking. After that, he put his hands again upon his eyes 